um, this is the book of Samuel part 20 and we'll be looking at um, 1 Samuel chapter 20 from verse 1 and David fled from Nelt in Ramah and he came and said before Jonathan what have I done what is my iniquity and what is my sin before thy father that he seeketh my life you know David was frustrated so he went to Jonathan and he was shouting what did I do for your father why is he just why is he why is he after my life verse 2 and he said unto him god forbid thou shalt not die behold my father will do nothing either great or small but that he will show it to me and why should my father hide this thing from me it is not so can you see that you know um jonathan is a type of son that that the father lost. So there's nothing the father will do that he will not tell Jonathan. But this particular movement of uh, the king to Ramah was not revealed to Jonathan. So Jonathan was surprised. Ah, why, why is it that my father did not tell me this? Do you know why? The reason was because at that point, Saul had already started suspecting Jonathan. He had been seeing a kind of strange closeness between Jonathan, his son, and David, his enemy, so to say. So because of that, he now began to suspect his son, Jonathan. So that was why he did not tell Jonathan about his movement. Because if the king had told Jonathan about his plan to go to Ramah, he wouldn't have met David there. Because Jonathan would have sent message to David, and David would have left Ramah, before the king came to Ramah. That was why the Lord had to bring the spirit of prophecy upon the king so that David can escape. So while Saul was lying down naked, prophesying unconsciously, David had already escaped with his men. Are you there? So before Saul and his soldiers, are you there? Gained consciousness, David had already left. So they came, they opened their eyes to meet David's absence. And there was nothing they could do to Samuel because Samuel was a man of stature. You can't even kill Samuel. Will you kill the person that ordained you to office? So Samuel was an unkillable man. You can't arrest him. Are you there? Samuel was like the, the physical representation of God in the land of Israel. So if, if you kill Samuel, the nation of Israel has ended. That's it. Are you there? Because the glory of the land of Israel, apart from the ark of God, is also resting on Samuel. So if you remove the ark of God from Israel, are you there? The only thing that can sustain Israel before the ark is returned is Samuel. That was how great the priests were, especially people like Samuel, who is not just a priest, who has become a high priest. Are you there? So, if you remove the ark of God from the land of Israel, the reason the land of Israel will still cope before the ark is returned is because of the presence of the high priest. So, if you remove the ark and the high priest, then Israel is finished. Are you getting what I'm saying? Okay. Verse 3. And David swore, Moreover, and said, Thy father certainly knoweth that I have found grace in thy eyes. And he said, Let not Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly, as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, there is, there is but a step between me and death. Can you see what David said? David said, I know your father is, is now suspecting you. He now knows that you are close to me. Now there is just a step between me and death. The reason... David said this because is because he knows that now the king will be doing so many things without telling Jonathan. So there will be nobody to reveal the king's intention to him. So he said, Kai, <laughs> I'm close to death now. The, 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 the meaning of that statement David made is, I am close to death, meaning I can die at any time. That's why David said there is but a step between me and death, meaning now that the king now knows that you are working for me, 
<laughs> my life is totally not secured. I can die at any time because there will be nobody to notify me of the king's plan. Then said Jonathan, verse 4, unto David, Whatsoever thy soul desireth, I will even do it for thee. And David said unto Jonathan, Behold, tomorrow is the new moon, and I should not fail to sit with the king at meat. But let me go, that I may hide myself in the field unto the third day at even. If thy father at all miss me, then say, David earnestly asked leave of me, that he might run to Bethlehem, his city. For there is a yearly sacrifice there for all the family. Can you see that? Verse 7. If he say thus, it is well, that servant shall have peace. But if he be very wroth, then be sure that evil is determined by him. Can you see that? So David said, well, Jonathan, the only thing you can do to help me is this. I know that by this time tomorrow, I'm supposed to be with the king. According to, you know, the my my function either as one of the king's worker. But please, I don't want to st- go to the king because he can just kill me there. So please, you tell the king that I've taken a leave from you. I don't want to go to the king now because I can die at any time. So just tell the king that I've taken a leave from you. If he says it is well, then that means I'm at peace. But if not, then there's a problem. Verse 8. Therefore, thou shalt deal kindly with thy servant. For thou hast brought thy servant into a covenant of the Lord with thee. Notwithstanding, if there be in me iniquity, slay me thyself. For why shouldest thou bring me to thy father? And Jonathan said, Far be it from thee, for if I knew certainly that evil were determined by my father to come upon thee, then would not I tell thee? Then said David to Jonathan, Who shall tell me? Or what if thy father answered thee roughly? And Jonathan said unto David, Come, let us go out into the field. And they went out, both of them, into the field. Can you see that? So, the plan had already been made, but the the problem is if Jonathan says, okay, okay, and David had taken leave from me, so don't worry, he took permission from me. If If the king says it is well, that means there's no problem. But if the king now shout at Jonathan, why will he take permission from you? Can't he come to me? That means there's a problem. That's what That's what David meant by saying, what if the king answer you roughly? To answer a person roughly means that you are not satisfied with the person's excuse. You are not satisfied with what the person is saying to you. Are you there? So Jonathan said, okay, don't worry. Let's go out to the field. I want to, do, I want to show you something. Verse 12. And Jonathan said unto David, O Lord God of Israel, when I have sounded my father, about tomorrow, any time, or the third day, and behold, if if there be good towards David, and I, then send not unto thee, and show it thee. The Lord do so, and much more to Jonathan. But if it pleases my father to do the evil, then I will show it thee, and send thee away, that thou mayest go in peace. And the Lord be with thee as he hath been with my father. Verse 14. And thou shalt not only while yet I live show me the kindness of the Lord that I die not. Verse 15. But also thou shalt not cut off thy kindness from my house forever. No, not when the Lord has cut off the enemies of David, everyone from the face of the earth. Can you see that? So Jonathan brought David out of the house and began to make a covenant. Are you there? So he looked at David and said, now look at me. I know at this point you can even begin to suspect me. 
But listen to me. If I get to the king tomorrow, and the king determined to do you evil, and I did not tell you, then God is, God bears me witness. God is looking at me. But I can assure you by the Lord that if I get to the king tomorrow, and I see that the king desires to do you evil, I will definitely send the message to you, and I will notify you so that you can escape. Are you there? Jonathan brought David out into the field to further strengthen the trust that David had for Jonathan. Because at that point, the trust is already growing weak. David is already getting scared because even to trust Jonathan is hard. But Jonathan now made a statement. You see, Jonathan was so sure that David would be the king. Are you there? So Jonathan now said, please, don't forget. When you ascend the throne, don't just show me kindness. Let this kindness be extended to my seed. Even when I die, make sure you show kindness to my seed. Are you there? Okay. This was why David looked for the man called Mephibosheth after he came to the throne. He was trying to be faithful to this covenant. It was the covenant made in this place that David was responding to. That was why he sent for Mephibosheth. So the good things David did for Mephibosheth when he ascended the throne was the act of his keeping his faithfulness to this covenant. Are you there? All right, let's continue. Verse 12, And David said unto David, Okay, we have done that. Now, so the covenant was made in, in verse 12, you know, from verse 12 to verse 15. Now, verse 16, now, so Jonathan made a covenant. Can you see that? Made a covenant with the house of David, saying, Let the Lord even require it at the hand of David's enemy. And Jonathan caused David to swear again, because he loved him. For he loved him as he loved his own soul. So the, the covenant began from verse 12 and then ended in verse 17. It was this covenant that was responsible for the kindness that David showed to Mephibosheth later, you know, in the verse. All right, verse 18. Then Jonathan said to David, Tomorrow is the new moon, and thou shalt be missed, because thy seat will be empty. And when thou hast stayed three days, then thou shalt go down quickly and come to the place where thou didst hide thyself when the business was in hand, and shall remain there by the stone Asia. And I will shoot three arrows on the side thereof, as though I shot at a mark. And behold, I will send a lad, saying, Go find out the arrows. If I expressly say unto the lad, Behold, the arrows are on the side of thee, take them, then come, then come down, for there is peace to thee, and no ought as the Lord liveth. But if I say unto the young man, Behold, the arrow are beyond thee, go thy way. For the Lord has sent thee away. Now, look at this. This was the sign that Jonathan gave to, to uh, you know, this was the sign that Jonathan gave to David. Let's read verse 23. And as touching the matter which thou and I have spoken of, behold, the Lord be between me and thee. Are you there? Now, let's read verse uh, 23, a part of a part of verse 21, sorry, again. Behold, the arrow are on the on this side of, of thee. Take them, then come down, for there is peace to thee, and no ought, as the Lord liveth. But if I say thus unto the young man, Behold, the arrow are beyond thee, go thy way, for the Lord has sent thee away. Now, what Jonathan was trying to do is this. Jonathan knew that his father is going to be around him, and there's no way he could communicate to David. So he said, now, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to shoot three arrows, and I'm going to send 
a young boy to go and look for it. So if I tell the young boy to look for the arrow, then know that there is peace. You can come out. But if I tell the young boy not to look for the arrow, then please run for your life. It means there's no peace. Are you there? So even when Saul was around, even when Saul is around Jonathan, he would not know that signal. So he would just know that um, Jonathan is shooting three arrows. All he will see is that Jonathan is saying, okay, okay, you, please go and look for the arrow. Or Jonathan is saying, don't bother to look for the arrow. Are you there? Those things are messages David understands, but the father does not understand. Are you there? So Jonathan is saying, if I tell the lad, the young boy, to go and look for the arrow, please know that there's peace, you can come out. But if I tell the lad not to bother looking for the arrow, please run for your life, it means there is no peace. Now, um, verse 23. Okay, verse 24. So David hid himself in the field, and when the new moon was come, the king sat him down to eat meat. And the king sat upon his seat, as at other times, even upon his seat by the wall. And Jonathan arose, and Abner sat by Saul's side, and David's place was empty. Nevertheless, Saul spoke not anything that day, for he thought something had befallen him. He is not clean. Surely he is not clean. Can you see that? To Saul, David was a rebellious person. To Saul, David was somebody that is fetish. So when he looked at David's seat, you know the plan was, they thought that the king would ask, where is this boy? Where is it? Are you there? So they had already planned that, okay, if the king asks of me, just tell him that I've taken permission from you. That was the plan. But they were so surprised that the king did not even ask about, the, the, the king did not even ask of David. Why? The king was thinking, well, <laughs> David is actually a fetish man, so probably while he's still trying to carry out his ritual, the gods have killed him. So he was thinking that, okay, maybe something has befallen him. Finally, I don't need to even chase him. Now he's dead. That was why he did not ask for David. Verse 27. And it came to pass on the morrow, which was the second day of the month, that David's place was empty. And Saul said unto Jonathan his son, Wherefore cometh not the son of Jesse to meet? Neither yesterday nor today. Are you there? The first day, the seat was empty. The king did not say anything. But the second day, now the king, the king now spoke and asked for David. And he faced Jonathan because he knew, of course, <laughs> he's already suspecting Jonathan. So he knew that, hey, Jonathan, we, we have something to say about David. So he turned to Jonathan and said, what is happening to this son of Jesse? The king knew David's name, but he decided to call him son of Jesse. Are you there? That was a sign of dishonor. Are you there? This, this identity, this um, uh, description is not a honorable description. So the king, it's just like the king knew David was a warrior. Instead of him to say, oh, where is David, my servant? He said, where is this son of Jesse? That introduction is not honorable. Please take note of that. Verse 28. And Jonathan answered, and Jonathan answered Saul, David earnestly leave of me to go to Bethlehem. And he said, let me go, I pray thee, for our family at a sacrifice in the city. And my brother, he had commanded me to be there. And now if I have found favor in thy eyes, let me get away. I pray thee, and see my brethren. Therefore, he cometh unto. Therefore, he cometh not unto the king's table. So, Jonathan now said, "Well, uh, the reason David is not around was because he actually told me he took permission from me. He went to a particular feast, and that was holding in his family. And then, you know, the, the the brothers told him that he has to be there. So, it's actually a must for him to be there. So, uh, if, if not for the the importance of that uh, feast, the family thing, he would he, he, he would not have gone." This was the exact thing both of them planned. And Jonathan did not change it. Jonathan is such a faithful friend. You see, you need friends like Jonathan. Those that will say the same thing they said in your presence, in your absence. Those are good friends. 
There are people that they will never say the same thing they are saying in your presence when you are not there. They say different thing in your absence. They say different thing in your presence. Those people are not good friends. Please take note of that. Are you there? And also there's something I want you to note. The king said, where is this son of Jesse? That means to the king, David had lost his honor. Are you there? You can lose your honor before men because you are standing for God. But I tell you the truth, your honor before the Lord is increasing. So you choose one, either to be an honorable before men or to be an honorable before God. So that people are looking down on you, that people are not honoring you, does not mean you are far away from God. It can be a sign that you are standing for God. Are you there? Are you there? Please take note of that. So that you are not getting honor as, as required does not mean you are in sin. No. It can just be that the same thing happening to David is what is happening to you. All right, verse 30. And Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan. And he said unto him, Thou son of the perverse, rebellious woman, do not I know that thou hast chosen the son of Jesse to thy own confusion and unto the confusion of thy mother's nakedness? Can you see that? The, the king abused Jonathan. He said, you are the son of a prostitute. I know you have chosen to work with this son of Jesse. And this thing you have decided to do is to the shame of your mother's nakedness. That is, that is one of, that's the most horrible statement anybody can ever hear, especially from his own biological father. Imagine your father calling you the, 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 the son of a prostitute. In a nutshell, what your father is saying is that you are not his son. He's saying you are a bastard. That's, that, that's one way to describe what Saul was saying. He's in the early saying Jonathan is a bastard. Just imagine your biological father looks at you and says you are a bastard. Imagine how you feel. This is the exact thing that happened to Jonathan. Jonathan was ready to bear the shame, bear the reproach, bear the pain, bear the suffering just to save his friend. This is true friendship. Are you there? You must be able to defend the one you claim to be your friend. It's not just about what you will get from the person. You should be able to sacrifice. Friendship without sacrifice is fake. What makes you friends is the sacrifice you can make for each other. And you get what I'm saying? All right, verse 31. For as long as the son of Jesse liveth upon the ground, thou shalt not be established, nor thy kingdom. Wherefore now send and fetch him unto me, for he shall surely die. Look at what the father said. He said, as long as this boy is, is alive, you will never be established. Now, what was he saying? Was he placing a curse on Jonathan? No. He was trying to counsel Jonathan, but it looks like a curse because he was speaking with a high voice. He said, are you, are, you, are you crazy? Don't you know that this fight I'm doing is for your own good? As long as this boy is here now, you will not be established. Meaning, as long as he's alive, if I die now, you will not ascend the throne. I'm doing all this thing for your own good. You this stupid Jonathan. I'm doing this thing for your own good. If this boy is alive, he will become a king. I want to kill him so that if I die, you can ascend the throne. That's what the king was trying to say. Verse 32. And Jonathan answered Saul, his father, and said unto him, Wherefore shall he be slain? What had he done? Can you see that? Now, finally, it has become, you know, it has become clear that Jonathan is working for David. And Jonathan was not afraid, you know, to reveal that. So he, he confronted his father and said, Hello, sir. You, have, you, you just sent people to go and kill him. Please, what has he done to you? Why will you kill him? He was saying this boldly to his father's face. Now, look at this. You see what Jonathan and Micah did to Saul. If it is an ordinary person that did it, they will have died a long time ago. But the reason the king could not do anything is because they are his children. They are his seeds. Are you getting what I'm saying? Verse 32. And Jonathan answered Saul his father and said unto him, Wherefore shall he be slain? What hath he done? Verse 33. And Saul cast a javelin at him to smite him. Whereby Jonathan knew 
that it was determined of his father to slay David. So Jonathan arose from the table in fierce anger and did eat and did eat no meat the second day of the month. For he was grieved for David because his father had done him shame. Can you see that? So the father tried to kill Jonathan with a javelin. The same way he was trying to kill David with a javelin. But the attempt was not successful. And the Bible says because of that, Jonathan did not eat from that feast. He began to fast for his friend, David. So because the, the reason he, he could not eat was because he knew that his father was ready. He had made up his mind to kill this boy. So that bit, you no, know, that sorrow, that sorrow in the heart of Jonathan could not even make him eat. Verse 35. And it came to pass in the morning that Jonathan went out into the field at the time, appointed with David, and a little lad with him. And he said unto the lad, Run, find out now the arrows which I shoot. And as the lad ran, he shot an arrow beyond him. And the lad was come to the place of the arrow which Jonathan had shot. Jonathan cried after the lad and said, Is not the arrow beyond thee? And Jonathan cried after the lad, Make speed, haste, stay not. And Jonathan's lad gathered up the arrows and came to his master. And the lad knew not anything. Only Jonathan and David knew this matter. And Jonathan gave his artillery to his, to his lad and said unto him, Go, carry them to the city. Can you see that? Now, the lad did not know anything. The young boy did not know anything. He did not know that Jonathan was using him to pass a message to David. So at a point, Jonathan shot another arrow that was beyond him. And of course, that was a sign, according to plan, for David to run for his life. So Jonathan gave his artillery. Artillery means, you know, the, the instrument of war. So he gave those things to the lad and sent the lad away. Verse, okay, verse 41. And as soon as the lad was gone, David arose out of a place towards the south and fell on his face to the ground and bowed himself three times. And they kissed one another and wept one with another until David exceeded. Can you see that? Jonathan and David, they saw each other, they hugged each other, and they cried. The love was so much. Now, the Bible says when David saw Jonathan, he bowed himself three times. Now, why did he bow himself? He bowed himself because the level of love that Jonathan showed to him challenged him. He could not believe that kind of love. He even thought, you see, David was not expecting Jonathan to keep that promise. It was already, at a point, he was even suspecting Jonathan. But when he saw that Jonathan was faithful, the faithfulness led him to bowing. So the, the faithfulness of Jonathan actually moved David to cry. He was so, he was so touched. Ah, this Jonathan is so faithful to me. He cried and bowed his head three times to the ground in appreciation to what Jonathan did, to Jonathan's faithfulness. So Jonathan's faithfulness, one, moved David to cry, two, moved David to bow his head to him three times. Are you there? They kissed each other. The word kiss means they fellowshiped with each other. Are you there? So they did little Bible study. Even in that sorrowful state, they fellowshiped, they kissed each other. Meaning they fellowship, they did little Bible study, they encouraged themselves in the Lord before they departed. Verse 42, And Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, for as much as we have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord be between me and thee, and between my seed and thy seed forever. And he arose and departed. And Jonathan went into the city. Can you see that? In that sorrowful state, the Bible said they kissed one another. No matter the state you find yourself, don't forget kissing. The word kissing means fellowship. It's still fellowship with one another. Even when the state, even when you are in a terrible state, fellowship with one another. These people, they were crying, they were so touched. Ah, this man wants to kill my friend. In that sorrowful mood, they kissed. They, they still shared fellowship. No matter what is happening to you, whether good or bad, it must not affect your fellowship. 
Are you there? You see, nothing is a problem except, you know, until when your fellowship is affected. No matter how big it is, it is not a problem. Anything that has not affected your fellowship with God has not yet become a problem. No matter how big it is. Even when somebody is pointing gun at you like this. Even when your landlady or your landlord is on your neck, just troubling you, they are collecting your rent and yet they are on your neck. Are you there? Even when your parents are against you, your family members are against you, it is not yet a problem if you can still fellowship. As long as your fellowship with God is intact, you don't have a problem. But anything that takes that affects your fellowship with God is qualified to be called a problem. Are you there? So what is a problem? A problem is that thing that can affect your fellowship with the Lord. Are you there? So that's why we must ensure that our fellowship with God is, is guarded. Nothing is affecting it. Are you there? The moment something affects it, then we have a problem. Um, this is the book of Samuel, part 21. We'll be looking at 1 Samuel, chapter 21, from verse 1. Then came David to Nob, to Ahimelech, the priest. And Ahimelech was afraid at the meeting of David. And he said unto him, Why art thou alone, and no man with thee? Verse 2, And David said unto Ahimelech, the priest, the king had commanded me a business, and had said unto me, Let no man know anything of the business whereabout I send thee, and what I have commanded thee. And I have appointed my servant to, to search and such a place. Verse 3 Now therefore, what is under thy hand? Give me five loaves of bread in my hand, or what there is present. Now, <laughs> David came to the priest called Ahimelech, you know, in the land of Nob. He was, you know, this was still in his attempt to escape from Saul. But unfortunately, when he got to the priest, he had to lie. The king was, you know, the priest was scared to see him. Ah, David, ah, you are a mighty man. Oh, what are you doing here? He said, well, uh, actually, you know, the king... Uh, sent me an error. That was not true. Are you there? So that was a lie. Are you there? So there, are, there were things that God permitted for them in the Old Testament because Jesus had not come. Are you there? Some of those things are not permitted now that Jesus has come because Jesus said it by himself. He said, to whom much is given, much is expected. So you are not expected to tell lies now. Because much has been given to you. So you are better to also give much. And there these people, much was not given to them. A little was given to them. So God expected little from them. The people of the Old Testament, no matter how powerful they are, God expected little from them. Because little was given. They did not see the much. You see, Jesus is the much of God. Jesus is the bigger picture of God. So whatever the Old Testament people saw, whatever picture of God they saw is a smaller one. So that's why the expectation of God from us in this dispensation, now that Jesus has come, is going to be bigger. Because more has been given to us. So we are also expected to reciprocate that kind gesture by also giving more to God. Are you there? Verse 4. Now, meanwhile, David was hungry. So when he got to the priest, he said, What do you have there? Anything you have, anything. Please just bring something I need to eat. Verse 4. And the priest answered David and said, there is no common bread in my hand. Or what, you know, okay. He said, there is no common bread under my hand, but there is hallowed bread. If the young man have kept themselves, at least from women. Are you there? So the priest is trying to say that, well, <laughs> I don't have a common bread. You see, in those days, there are two types of bread. There's the common bread and there's the hallowed bread. The hallowed bread is the one that is eaten by the priest. It's for the priest. Are you there? And one of the consecrations you must keep to eat the hallowed bread is that you must stay away from sex. That's why the priest is now saying, well, I'm sorry. There's no common bread. Why? Common bread is the bread that everybody can eat, both the saint and the sinner. So, the priest now said, well, I'm sorry. The bread you see now, 
This one you are asking for is not a common bread. It's a hallowed bread. And that one is for those who have kept themselves from sexual intercourse. Now let's listen to what David said. And David answered the priest and said unto him, Of a truth, women have been kept from us about these three days since I came out. And the vessel of the young men are holy. And the bread is in a manner common. Yeah, though it were sanctified this day in the vessel. So David now said, well, eh, if that is the case, eh, we have been moving from one mountain to another. We don't even have time to sleep with our wives. So obviously, me and all my men, because there's no, there's no woman among us, so we can't suspect anything called sex. So me and my men, we have left home for long. So we have not had sex for some time. So we, I think we are qualified to eat this bread. Verse 6. So the priest gave him hallowed bread. But there was no bread but the shoot bread that was taken from before the Lord to put hot bread in the day when it was taken away. So uh, the shoe bread is an example of a hallowed bread. In other words, you can say shoe bread is a hallowed bread. Shoe bread, that is S-H-E-W-B-R-E-A-D. You can see that in verse 6. So shoe bread is an example of a hallowed bread. All right, verse 7. Now a certain man of the servant of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord, and his name was Doeg. An Edomite, the chiefest of the herdsmen that belonged to Saul. Now, this Doeg was the captain, was the leader of all the herdsmen that Paul has. So, you know, being a man that had a high position with Saul, he was around. And he knew that Saul was after the, the life of David. Let's watch what happens. Now, Verse 8, And David said unto Ahimelech, And is there not here under thy hand spear or sword? For I, have for I have neither brought my sword nor my weapon with me, because the king's business required haste. David was still, he still continued in that line. Are you there? Still continued in that line. So, you know, he was now asking for, for sword sword from the from the priest uh, is there any sword there because i came empty actually david came empty because he was coming without any sword and that was why the priest was even surprised the priest were like ah, david this one i'm seeing you you are just walking like a normal civilian no sword nothing i hope all is well now let's look at the the reply of the priest verse 9 and the priest said the sword of goliath the Philistine, whom thou slewest in the valley of Elah. Behold, it is here, wrapped in a cloth behind the effort. If thou wilt take that, take it. For there is no other, for there is no other, save, for there is no other, save that here. And David said, there is none like that. Give it me. Can you see that? So the only sword that was available was the sword of Goliath. That means when Goliath was killed, they kept his sword in the temple. Just like museum. They kept it there so that, you know, they kept it as a memorial. So that generations after generations, they can show it to them. And say, well, one, some time ago, through the hand of a man called David, Goliath was killed as a proof of what, you know, to show you the proof of what you are saying. Let's go to the temple so that you can see his sword. So the temple in those days is not only for worship. There are other things they do there. They also keep things in the temple. There's also a section of the temple that can be called a museum. And that is where the sword of um, Goliath was kept. But it happened to be that this day, David needed something with which he can fight. So he ordered for the sword of Goliath. And David arose and fled that day for the fear of Saul. And he went to Achish, the king of Gath. Can you see that? Why did he run? He ran because Doeg was there. 
He knew Doeg was a high-ranking man with Saul. He knew that Doeg will never keep the secret. That was why he ran. Verse 13. And he changed his behavior before them. He changed his behavior before them and framed, you know, and framed himself mad in their hands and scrabbled on the doors of the gates and let his spittle fall down upon his bed. Can you see that? Now, <laughs> you know, the land of guts is actually the land of enemies. Obviously, if David step into that place without any, uh, any sword or anything, they are going to kill him. So when he got to God, he, he, he now displayed like a madman. So he, he now, you know, he began to act like somebody that is mad, somebody that is mentally disordered. So he began to put spit on his bad. He was spitting, releasing spit like somebody that is a, a, a dummy. Now, verse 14. Then said Akish, the king of God, unto his servants, Lo, ye see the ye see the man ye see that the man is mad wherefore then have ye brought him to me i see that so the king was angry ah, why will you bring to me a man that is hard a, a, a man that is mad sorry ah, what's the meaning of this what's my business with the madman if you want to bring somebody to my palace bring people that are that are healthy verse 15 i have need of madmen that ye have brought this fellow to play the mad in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? So the king was asking, what's my business with a madman? Why have you brought a madman to my presence? Can I bring a madman to my house? Can you see that? This was what David did to save himself in the land of God. So if you are asked in the Bible, who displayed like a madman? David was the man. He acted the role of a madman just to save himself. Either because as he's running from some moving from one territory to another, he knew that there are certain territories that are also against him. So in such territory, he need to put up an act, you know, put up an act, sorry, in order to safeguard his life. I pray the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Now, this is the wisdom of God. Don't sell it. Now, before we even go, before we end this series, what are the things you have learned from this message? Now, this happened while David was running from one place to another. David, David was in a state of restlessness. Because he was in a state of restlessness, he had to lie. He had to lie. He had to sin. So, when the devil succeeds in bringing you to the state of restlessness, he will keep you in sin. Because there's no way you will be restless that you will not tell a lie. It's not possible. A restless man is a sinful man. A, a man that is restless is likely, he, he has every tendency to go into sin. Yes, because in the state of restlessness, you are not in your right sense. You are not in your right sense. So there's nothing you cannot do. Are you getting what I'm saying? So that's why the Bible says we should guard our heart with all diligence. As long as you keep guarding your heart with diligence, you are going to maintain your state of rest. You are going to maintain a state of rest, a state of calmness. Are you there? And when you maintain that state, it becomes hard for the devil to manipulate you. Why? Because you are coordinated, because you are settled. Are you there? So if there's any lesson you should learn from here, it should be the need to guard your heart so that you can maintain a state of calmness before the Lord. The moment you become restless, there's danger because you can fall into sin and any other thing can happen to you. May the Lord help us to maintain our, our rest in the name of Jesus. The Bible says, he, you know, he that has entered into his rest is seized from troubles. What does it mean? So God brings us into rest so that we can be free from, from trouble. But the devil brings us into restlessness so that we can you know, be surrounded with troubles. It's not the same thing. God will bring you into his rest so that you can be free from your troubles according to the scripture. But the aim of the devil is to bring us out of, to take us away from rest so that we can be surrounded by troubles. May the Lord keep you in his rest in the name of Jesus. May you not be restless in the name of Jesus. This is the wisdom of God. Don't sell it.
Um, this is the book of Daniel, part 22. And then we are going to be looking at 1 Samuel, chapter 22, from verse 1. Now, David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave Adullam. This was what led David to Adullam. After he displayed like a madman to save himself in the land of Gath, before Achish the king, he left. And the next place he went to was the cave called Adullam. So when he left Gath, the next location was to Adullam. Now Adullam is a cave. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down either to him. So when the people of uh, David's, uh, when, when, when David's family, the people of his father's uh, household, when they heard that, ah, David is in, is in the cave of Adullam, everybody left and they followed him. They went to meet him there in Adullam. Verse 2. Everyone that was distressed. Now let's look at the, uh, the qualities of those people that joined David. In Adullam. Meanwhile, at that point, David was also distressed. Are you there? All right, let's look at the qualities of those people that came to join David in cave Adullam. Number one, the Bible says, uh, everyone that was in distress, meaning those people that were distressed. Number two, everyone that was in debt, <laughs> people that are hoeing. So <laughs> those that were in distress, they came to meet him there because the life is no longer interesting. Number two, those that were in debt. So they ran away from their creditors. They ran away from those who they borrowed from. At least so that by the time they come to check them at home, <laughs> they will not be at home. So in order to be free from the creditors coming, they, they followed, they ran to meet him in the cave of Adullam. Number three, the Bible says, everyone that was discontented. Are you there? Discontented is also a negative picture. Are you there? Number four. Okay. Okay. All right, these were the three things, people that were distressed, people that were in debt, and also those that were discontented. The Bible said they gathered themselves unto him, and he became a captain over them. And there we are with him, about 400 men. So about 400 men who were in trouble gathered themselves together with David in Adula. And then David now became their captain. So David was the captain of distressed men. <laughs> because he was distressed, so he became the captain of distressed men. David was also in debt too. There will, there will be some people he will collect some things from. And he will not even bother to go back to, to refund it because, because of the fear of uh, being killed by Saul. Right there. So David was the captain of distressed people. He was the captain of people who were in debt. He was the captain of people who were discontented. Are you saying that? So that the, the, the current state of David is what attracted those people to him. Your condition, your current condition can determine the type of people that will surround you. That's the truth. So that was, you know, that was the current state of David. And the people that looked like, the people that were in that similar condition surrounded him. They gathered with him and they became their captain. Verse 3. And David went thence. So David left the place. And from, from Adullam, he went to Mizpah. Mizpah of Moab. That means Mizpah is in Moab. And he said unto the king of Moab, Let my father and my mother, I pray thee, comfort and be with you till I know what God will do for me. Can you see that? So David took his father and his mother. He kept them with the king of Moab. So that they can be safe because it cannot be, you know, moving them around because they are old. Are you there? So that means when David came to Adullam, the entire family came to meet him, including his father and mother. That is to tell you how serious it was. Now, this is what happened. By revelation, now we can see that the problem of David actually affected everyone in his family. Are you there? Yes, everybody was concerned. Because at this point now, Saul was no longer after David alone. He had already sent threats to the family of David because he, he felt, okay, the, the family of David, they will know his whereabouts. So he had already sent threats to them, sent letters to them. 
I give you seven days to present David to me. If you fail to do so, all of you are dead men. I'm speaking to you by revelation now. If you fail to do so, all of you are dead men. <laughs> this was the threat they had. And there's no way they can present their, 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 you know, their, their, their brother to be killed by the king. And the day is running. Day one, day two, day three. No way. What did they do? Mm. They ran to meet him in, Ad in Adula. It's better to go and join you where you are and die with you than to present you only to be killed by the king. That's what led to the massive movement of everybody in his family towards his direction in Adulam. Verse 5, and, and the prophet Gath said unto David, Abide not in the hold, depart, and get thee into the land of Judah. Then David departed and came to the forest of Harat. Can you see that? Harat. He came to the forest of Harat. Now, while David was in the land of Moab, a prophet called Gad came to him and said, Hey, leave this place. Escape for your life. Can you see that? It was no longer where uh, Jonathan, his lovely friend, could give him instruction. But God, because God was interested in his safety, God sent his prophet called Gad to give him a direction. At that point, only obedience will now determine if he will be secured or not. There was no Jonathan around, yet God sent prophet Gad to direct him. God is always ready to direct us. The problem is, are you willing to obey? God will give you instruction. The, the, the issue is obedience. There are many things God has told you to do now that you have not done. So the part of God is to give us instruction. Our own part is to be obedient. God will not be obedient for you. The giver of the instruction is not supposed to be the one that should be obedient to it. No. The instructor, the function of the instructor is to instruct. Meanwhile, the one that is being instructed, his role is to be obedient to the instruction. So everybody must play their role well for safety to be attained. So because Jonathan was not around, God sent prophet God. And God told David, leave this place. Make sure you don't stay here to secure your life. Now verse 6. When Saul heard that David was discovered, then the men that were with him. Now Saul... Okay, when, when Saul heard that David was discovered and the men that were with him, now Saul abode in Giba under a tree in Ramah, having his spear in his hand, and all his servants were standing about him. So can you see that as a king now? He was standing, he was sitting under the tree, and you know, soldiers were surrounding him. That's the tight security that, uh, that a king has. The same way you see the president of nowadays with policemen, soldiers, a lot of security is very tight around them. It has been like that even from the Bible days. Look at King Saul. The Bible says his, his soldiers were around him. That's a tight security uh, formation. Verse 7. Then Saul said unto his servant that stood about him, Here now, ye Benjamites, will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards and make you all captains of thousands and captains of hundreds, that all of you have conspired against me, and there is none that showeth me that my son hath made a league with the son of Jesse. And there is none of you that's, that is sorry for me, or showeth unto me that my son has teared up my servant against me to lie in wait as at this day. Now it was in verse 7 and 8 that, uh, King Saul came to the full understanding of the facts that Jonathan was working for David. He never knew. All this why he was suspecting. But in this verse, he came to the reality that, ah, my son has been working for David. So he now called his servant and said, now, is there anybody here now that David has promised to give land or camel or anything? What does he even have to give to you? Because I don't know why you will lie to me. You saw all these things and you did not tell me. So the king was challenging them. He was telling them, okay, what does he have to give you now? Maybe it's because of his gifts. That's why you, you chose to be loyal to him. You saw my son betraying me and yet you did not tell me. How much does David have to give you? Because for you to be able to decide to, you know, for you to decide to keep quiet when you saw all this, it means David must have promised to give you something. That's why, you know, the king was saying all this. Let's check verse 9. Then, 
answered Doeg, the Edomite, which was set over the servant of Saul, and said, I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob, to Aimelech, the son of Aitob. And he inquired of the Lord for him, and gave him virtuous, and gave him the sword of Goliath, the Philistines. Can you see that? Now, after Saul had made this statement, you know, Doeg was there. Doeg felt, okay, okay, let me try to me. Let me try to play the role of, uh, you know, let me play the role of a good servant. So suddenly, Doeg that had forgotten before that he saw uh, David uh, in, um, in the land of Nob with the priest. Now he said, okay, 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 okay. Now let me show the priest that, let me show the king that me am a faithful servant. He said, okay, our oh, king. I saw David. I saw him with the priest. He even collected the, the sword of Goliath. Yes. The, the priest even gave him food to eat. Yes, I saw him. Meanwhile, this information that he was given to the king had already become a late information because David had left that place. He had left that place. Are you getting what I'm saying? He had left for long. But he was just saying those things so that he can at least look like a, a faithful servant. Verse 11. Then the king sent to call Aimelech, the priest, the son of Hytop, and all his father's house, and the priests that were in Nob. Now, what, this is what the king did. He called the king, Aimelech, uh, the priest Aimelech in the land of Nob. He called, uh, he called all the family of Aimelech and also all the priests in the land of Nob. He called them. And they came, all of them, to the king. And Saul said, Hear now, the son of Hytop. And he answered, I am here, my lord. In those days when you are referring to a king, you use the word, my lord. The king is your lord. The reason you call a king your lord is because when a king gives you an instruction, there's nothing like, uh, I will think about it. You don't need to think. You just have to go and do it. Do it first. You have to go and do it first. Later, you now face the consequence. That's it. That's the meaning of a lord. A lord is that person that when he gives you an instruction, you don't have to think about it. The next thing is just to obey. Whether it will lead to your death or it will lead to your protection, because it is a, it is a lord that is talking. You have to obey without considering the consequence. Verse 13. And Saul said unto him, Why have ye conspired against me, thou and the son of Jesse, in that thou hast given him bread and a sword, and hast inquired of God for him? that he should rise against me to lie in wait as at this day. And Ahimelech answered the king and said, And who is so faithful among all thy servants as David, which the king's son-in-law, which is the king's son-in-law, and goeth at thy biddings, and is honorable in thy house? The king was asking the priest, priest Ahimelech, Why have you betrayed me? Why did you give him bread? Why did you give him the sword? Why did you pray for him? Because actually, Ahimelech prayed for David. To inquire from the Lord for someone also involves prayer. That means you seek, you, are, you want to, you check the mind of God for, for a person. Are you there? And those kind of things, we definitely hand in prayer. So Saul was challenging him. But unfortunately, <laughs> the priest did not answer the question of Saul. He was rebuking Saul. He said, ah, out of all these servants that you gather now, these people who are, who are at your back now, that you think you are saved, that David that you want to kill is the most faithful. So why do you want to kill a servant? So the priest was answering the king. He did not answer the question of the king. He was questioning the question of the king. So he called the king Lord. But at that time, he was not you know, speaking to him as a Lord. He was speaking to him as an ordinary man. Either because you don't rebook a lot, that's the thing. Whether a lot is wrong or not, you don't rebook a lot. A lot is always right, that's the implication of becoming a lot. So, when you become a king, you are always right. But if you say go and kill that person, you're always right. Are you there? So, now let's look at the reaction of King Saul, verse 15. Did I begin to that was still that this is still the priest talking here? He said, Did I begin to inquire of God for him? Be it far from me, let not the king input anything unto his servant, nor to all the house of my father. For thy servant knew nothing of all this, less or more. And the king said, Thou shalt surely die, I may let thou and all thy father's house. So the king said, For this that you have done, you will surely die. Not only you, all your father's house, not only that, all the priests in the land of Nob, 
all of you will die today. And the priest was even telling him that, King, I don't know anything about this, but Samuel did not, Saul did not believe. Now, was the priest saying the truth? Yes. Can you see that? The priest was not telling a lie. He said, I don't do anything about what is happening between the two of you. And that is true. That was why David could lie to him and he believed. He thought everything was fine. It was when he got to the palace that he now discovered that, okay, there is, you know, there is a fight between David and, meanwhile, David had already lied to him that the king sent him an error. But because he was a, he was a priest, there's no point saying, ah, actually, I don't mind that man. He lied to me. No, no, no. That's, he did not bother to say those things. But the king was so angry that he was not ready to listen to him. And the king said unto the footmen that stood about him, Turn and slay the priests of the Lord, because their hand is also with David, and because they knew when he fled and did not show it to me. But the servant of the king would not put forth their hand to fall upon the priest of the Lord. Can you see that? Saul said, All right. Kill this priest. Why? The only reason he wants them to kill the priest of the Lord. Though. He wants them to kill the priest of an entire land. To kill the, the, the chief priest, and the, the, the high priest, which is Aimelech, the high priest of the land, and also the, to kill the family of the priest. Now look at three things that Saul wants to do. He wants to kill the high priest of the land, which is Aimelech. Number two, he wants to kill the entire family of the high priest of the land, which is Aimelech. Number three, he wants to kill the entire priest. So that that land, we have no priest. So he told his servant, he said, oh, yeah, kill them. But the Bible says the servant, they did not obey. They were fearful. Why? Because they were, they were thinking, how are we going to kill the priest of the Lord? You see, Saul was a very foolish man. Very foolish, insensitive, and ignorant. David had opportunities to kill this foolish man, this foolish king also. But David did not kill him. Why? Because David said, this man is an anointed man. And Saul was aware. David told him, I should have killed you, but I left you because you are an anointed man. Now, the same man that was feared because of his anointing, because he was an anointed man, is now ordering his servant to kill another anointed. Can you see foolishness? So the, the servants were not willing to do the job. And the, sing, and the king said to Doeg, Turn thou and fall upon the priest. And Doeg, the Edomite, turned, and he fell upon the priest and slew on that day four score and five persons that did wear the, the lining, that did wear a lining effort, meaning he, he killed four score and five priests. Four score, that is 20 times four, his score is 20. So 20 times four is 80. And five, that is 80 plus five. So that day, Doeg was the one that had boldness to carry out the king's ungodly command. So Doeg, you know, do, some people in their quest to be, to be faithful servants, there's nothing they can do. They can even curse God because they want to be loyal to a man. Such, so, what, 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 what a height of foolishness. So Doeg, because he wants to be faithful, he was the one that did the job. Others were afraid. They had the fear of God. How are we going to kill the priest of the Lord? They stood back. Doeg was the only one that did the job. Verse 19. And no, the city of priests smote he with the head of the sword, both men and women, children and sucklings and oxen and asses and sheep with the edge of the sword. Can you see that? Because of David, an entire land was wiped off. Why? Because of David. Because of Jesus too, several children were killed. Because of Moses, several children were also killed. Can you see that? The devil is after a godly seed. There's nothing he cannot do. But glory to God that he always fails. May the devil fail over your case in the name of Jesus. Verse 20. And one of the sons of Aimelech, the son of Haitop, named Abiata, escaped and fled after David. So in that land, it was only one person that escaped. That was the son of the priest. And his name was Abiata. So he went to, Saul, he went to David. 
Verse 21, And Abiathar showed David that Saul had slain the Lord's priest. Please take note of this. It was due to David's lie that led to all this calamity. David lied to the priest, the priest, and he entertained him. Because if the priest had known, he wouldn't have entertained David. That's the truth. Because he, he knew that, the, you know, he knew the king would not be happy. In those days, the priest is also under the king. So the priest also, the same way the priest can instruct the king, the king can also instruct the priest. So it is, it is in two ways. Are you getting it? So because of the lie of, because of David's lie, an entire land was wiped off. There's no small sin. There's no big sin. Sin is sin. Are you there? All sins carry the same weight. The one that took meat from the pot and the one that robbed the bank. Both of them are thieves. There's no big sin or small sin. Are you there? The one that slept is with his wife to be. Yeah, wife to be. Oh. Are you there? The one that slept with his wife to be before marriage and the one that went to the house of prostitute and slept with a lady. Both of them had committed fornication. There's no, no, no one is bigger than the other. Are you getting what I'm saying? Uh -huh. So the one that they sent an errand, there's change. He said, ah, there's no change. Are you there? The one that they sent to market to buy something. He saw it for 5,000 naira, but he came by and said, ah, I bought this thing 10,000. Ah, thank God I, I was even able to buy it. It's the same sin as the one that is forging check, turning 1 million to 1 billion. It's the same offense. Stealing is stealing. No one is bigger than the other. Are you there? Look at just a lie from David lead to the destruction of an entire city. Verse 22, And David said unto Abiathar, I knew it that day when Doeg the Edomite was there, that he would surely tell Saul, I have occasioned the death of all the persons of their father's house. Can you see David? One thing about David, one thing you must learn about David is admittance, responsibility. David is a man that always takes responsibility. He said it boldly before Abiata. He said, Abiata, I'm the cause of the death of everybody in this land. He said it. That is responsibility. He was not hiding himself away from it. He was not hiding away from reality. He was plain. I'm the reason for this thing. If there's anything you should learn from David, is you know, you need to learn to be frank. You need to learn to always take responsibility. Verse 23. Abide thou with me, fear not, for he that seeketh my life, seeketh thy life. But with me thou shalt be in safeguard. So David now said, don't worry, stay with me. Stay with me. Whoever wants to kill you, wants to kill me. Are you there? So, whoever is after you is after me. I will, I will ensure I keep you safe as the Lord helps me. So, Abiata joined the Adulam people. So, he now became a member of uh, David's army. Are you there? May the Lord help us to understand his word in the name of Jesus. Please, as you listen to these messages, draw moral lessons. What is the Lord saying to you? It's very important. This is what defines um, how well you'll be blessed. Do you get it? This is what defines uh, your, your being blessed from the message. The Lord bless you in the name of Jesus. This is the wisdom of God.